we're gonna discuss the EKG. So uh, I I want you to interact. Uh, it's not an exam. It's an exercise. So I want you to at the end of the exercise to feel more comfortable when you see an EKG. So don't bother to ask questions, don't feel any question as stupid or uh, don't feel ashamed to ask something. Uh, EKG is something uh, very important it, and in some cases it's really, really uh, significant and in other it's not the only methodology to rely on. So. I think that every student, every every doctor should uh, know how to read ECG. So feel free to ask anything, and if I can't answer at the point, I'm gonna publish the answer later on on the course uh, page. So the most important thing about this exercise is to interact or to feel. Uh, free to read the ECG. So don't bother, ask anything, right? Okay. So uh, I know that it's in English, but uh, the, 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 the figures uh, and the, the, the pictures are mainly in English, so I didn't uh, translate them because uh, the the exercise is going to be mainly discussion. So, uh, if you don't feel like uh, uh, it in, in Bulgarian, later on when I put it in the wall, I'm going to translate it. But we are mainly discussing. So I didn't bother to translate it. Don't don't quote me that. But because we are uh, interacting, I don't I don't feel like. Uh, mm, the need to translate it. So, whenever you see an ECG, there's three things you have to discuss first and foremost, and then if there is any other pathology, you have to, to mention it as well. So, what's the first thing you need to to say to when you read ECG, to, to define? All right. Uh, can you speak loudly? The heart rate. That's the second most important thing. The first thing, the first and sinus, one of them. If it's in sinus rhythm or not? Yes, that's the most important thing to define. What's the rhythm of the heart? So, uh, there you have, we, we're going to discuss later on. This is uh, examples of, uh, of one of the other most important things we should discuss when we, when we see ECG. But the first thing is, what is the rhythm? So, when you have, in this case, P waves before every QRS complex, the P wave is with the same morphology everywhere, uh, and uh, it's uh, the distance between the P wave and the QRS complex is almost the same, the RR intervals or the PP intervals are almost the same, and the P wave is positive here in V or in lead two, and negative here in lead AVR, and sometimes be phasic in lead V one. Then you have a sinus rhythm. Is this clear? Yes. Yes. So, uh, then what? You said it before. Heart oh, rate. Yes, you have to define the heart rate. How can you define the heart rate? Without the help of the EKG machine. Can use the time between. Um, can you wait a little bit? Probably I have a problem with the volume, 
and that's why I, I don't hear you well. Sorry. Can you can somebody somebody speak? Testing, testing, one, two, three, okay, testing. Okay, it's, it's perfect. Thank you. So, heart rate. How can you define the heart rate? You can work out the time difference between the peaks and do it that way. Yes, but how can you do that? I think well, we have a standard uh, velocity in the in yes, the detection of the machine. Yes, we usually use 25 uh, millimeters per second, and you are defining the 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 R the the, use the R intervals. You are using that to measure the rhythm, the 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 rate, right? Yeah. So there's several ways to measure the the heart rate. Can you tell me at least one? Do you do the uh, or take an average? Can you uh, can you repeat it? Do you um, measure the R to R interval, the yes. square, and you take an average? Yes, but you take it average. How? How can you measure? Oh, you count how many big the big squares, and um, you count yeah, three. That, that's what I'm asking. Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, you count the big squares, and then you divide by um, six hundred. No. Um, sorry. You have no. You have two ways. You okay. can count the big squares and the small squares. So, this is the formula. When you are using uh, the small squares, you divide one thousand and five hundred to the to the number of small squares, and when you are using the big squares, you divide the number of big squares, uh, uh, you divide 300 to the number of the big squares. I usually use the, the second way, I usually use the big squares because it's easier, as it is, it, but it's not the most correct way because uh, small squares are a little bit more appropriate, but uh, usually we are using the, 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 the heart rate as uh, uh, you just as a orientation. If you if you want to, to, to measure it correctly, you have to, to use the small square way. So as it is in this case, the count of the the, the, the big square is around three. So you divide the, the 300 to 3, and you uh, you see that the, the, the heart rate is around 100. Here, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and you divide the, the number, uh, you divide 300 to 6, and you, you get 50, uh, 50 beats per minute. Um, professor, do you just use one R to R interval, or do you do an average? Uh, when you have uh, almost equal R intervals, you don't need to use average. You you need average R interval when you have atrial fibrillation because you have different R intervals. So you have to to take at least five and average them, and then divide it because at some point. Uh, Usually, uh, you have uh, you don't you don't have constant AV blocking atrial fibrillation, so uh, the conduction every time is different. So you have different R intervals. Sometimes uh, in young people in sinus rhythm, you have sinus arrhythmia, and the R interval is not the same every time. But then you can average as well. But usually, you when the patient is in, in, in uh, sinus rhythm and the R intro interval is seems constant, then you don't need average. Thank you. Have I answered? Yeah, thank you. So, rhythm, heart rate. So, can... Do you feel any need to discuss it further 
to, to give you more examples to, to try and define the, 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 the heart rate on one of these six examples or you feel uh, confident and you can do it. Yeah, you are okay with the rates. You are okay with the rates. So, what's next? What, what's next? Cardiac axis? Yes. This is one of the most difficult things to define for students and for some doctors, of course. It was quite difficult for me as well. But let's see how you do it. I have given you the triangle and there are some examples. So, these two figures are uh, a way to help you define the axis. So, how can you define the axis? Of course, there are several ways, at least two I can think of it, uh, I can think of them now, but I usually use the way I, I've showed you in this presentation, so I'm not using any other. So, what is the, the heart axis? Is when the, the two the QRS complex are both positives in lead 1 and AVF? No, what is the axis? What, what what the axis uh, represent? It shows the electrical activity of the heart and it is determined not by the cardiac like, cords uh, from the limbs. Okay, it's defined by the limb limbs and as you said, it's the electrical activity of the heart, but it's not just the electrical activity of the heart, is where the electrical impulse goes from where to where. So, uh, as, a mathem as a mathematical uh, thing, because I, I, I can't remember the, t the term, it's a vector. So it, it has a beginning and it has a direction. Because when you are defining the, the electrical axis, you are seeing where the electrical, electrical impulse goes. So, what chambers define the electrical axis? The QRS complex? No, no, what chamber? Of the heart? Um, the ventricles. Is it both ventricles or one of them? Uh, the electrical axis is a, summary, a, summary, uh, a sum of electrical impulses. So it's gonna, def it's gonna be defined by where it goes, by where the most muscle cells are. Where are the most muscle cells? Left ventricle. So mainly the electrical axis represents the impulse propagation and the electrical activity or electrical activation of left ventricle. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. So, as we define that, usually the electrical axis of the heart goes to the left, downwards, and a little bit to the back because that, that's the location of the left ventricle. But let's discuss how can we define the, the electrical axis. It's, if we, uh, the triangle of Eindhoven, if we uh, derive four quadrants, I'm using the, the, quadrant, the quadrant methodology for defining the, the axis, so if if we uh, derive, if we uh, divide it on four quadrants, usually uh, downward and to the left is this, quad this quadrant. So 
So mainly the axis is located here. So how can we divide? How can we de the, uh, define the electrical axis? What are we using? One of you said that we are using limb blades. Do you know why? We are using them because they have they are bi biphasic. They, uh, they have uh, by having two poles, the deep poles. You can you can uh, not only uh, locate you you can find the direction of, of the electrical impulse propagation, uh, but you can also see whether it's going perpendicular. That's why I'm showing this limb leads. When you have mainly positive QRS complex, the electrical impulse is going to this leg. When you have electric, when you have biphasic deeply equiphasic, uh, then the impulse is going perpendicular to this leaf. And when it's mainly negative, then the electrical impulse is going away from it. So uh, I know that it's a little bit abstract for you. Now, which lead you you have to to know that the limb leads are biphasic because uh, one of their direction is uh, used, the, the, the lead is taken from uh, from two points, uh, but the, the precordial leads, they are monophasic, so they can be used for direction, orientation. So, if you want to uh, to go further in this team, you have to read a little bit so we can discuss it. Uh, here you have to take it for granted. Uh, so we are using limb leads. When you are mainly, when it's mainly positive, it goes to the to the direction of the lead. When it's mainly negative, it goes away from the lead. And when it's uh, bif biphasic, uh, it's perpendicular to that lead. Uh, those two examples are uh, are mainly used for defining the axis because when you have a positive lead, you, you have several positive leads and then you have to find the most equiphasic or biphasic lead so that you can define the, the axis to the uh, to that uh, quadrant. I'm going to show you that in the next example. Okay? I know okay. it seems a little bit difficult, but it's more difficult when I I'm explaining in, uh, I'm explaining in than uh, when it's shown. So here, usually we are using which leads? We are using using lead number one because it's on zero degrees and lead ABF because it's on 90 degrees. And usually when they are positive, the axis is between them. Okay? This is simple. So, whenever you, you have to define the axis, you first check lead number one and lead ABF, right? I just need the confirmation. Yes. Okay. Okay. So next, you find most equiphasic lead, which is lead AVL, and then the axis is between lead between the first lead and the lead AVF, and it's on ninety degrees uh, to their direction. So. What's happening? Here is easier. So first, it is positive. AMF is positive. So uh, the axis is in this quadrant. I'll show the mouse. The, the axis is here. Then the most 
equiphasic is lead ABL, right? Right, the R is almost equal to the S. That means, that's what means equiphasic. So, it's here and it's on 90 degrees from lead ABL. So, minus 30. Uh, when we uh, take 90 from my, minus 30, you have 60. So the axis is around here on 60 degrees. Do you get it? Did you? Could you explain it one more time? So, you check lead number one and lead number two. If both of them are positive, then the axis of the heart is around here. Right? Yes. Because if one of them is negative, if lead uh, AVF is negative, then you are uh, the axis in this on the run. If uh, first lead is negative, then the axis is here in this quadrant. If both of them is negative, the axis is here in this quadrant. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. So, we checked that first and AVF are both, are both positive. Then the, the axis here is in, the, in this quadrant between 0 and 90 degrees. Then we we search for the most equiphasic lead in which R is almost equal to S or if you have Q, it's almost equal to R. In that lead, uh, due to the uh, electrical activity propagation, the signal is going perpendicular because that's why we are using biphasic lead. And so that we can use them to, to define the axis. And the most biphasic lead is AVL, which is on minus 30 degrees. So you have the quadrant, and you know that the axis is 90 degrees away from AVL in this quadrant. Did you get it now? Yes, thank you very much. Yes. So it's around 60 degrees. Can somebody try to define the axis here? Don't. So. Don't. Yes, please. Two looks like the most biphasic there, yes, right? Yes. Oh, no. Sorry, oh. first we need. Yes. Sorry to. to so first we need to look at one and, was it AVL, right? AVF. Uh, one and AVF, and one, one is positive and yes. AVF is negative. Yes, so when, means, just a second, so when uh, one is positive and AVF is negative, then you have it here, right, in this quadrant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we find the most equiphasic lead, which you have defined as? Two. Yes, the second. So the second is on 60 degrees. So it'd be minus 30. Yes. Because that's 90 degrees offset from, yes. and it's yes. the only 90 degree offset in that Yes, quadrant. in that quadrant. <laughs> it's as easy as that. The explanation is more difficult than finding it. You, you, have, you just don't have to bother with mathematical analysis it is, as what vector is, what biphasic lead is, what monophasic lead is. You just need one AVF and the most equiphasic lead. And that's it. So can somebody go, let's see here. Oh, sorry. This example. Can somebody try it? I could try. Yes, please. Okay, so we can see that lead number one is positive and... Uh, wait, 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 wait. This is lead number one. 
Sorry. This, this example. Oh, sorry. Okay, I can see that the late num I was looking up and right. So, uh, late number one is negative. Yes. And the limb number, uh, limb uh, AVF is positive. So, we are positive, yes. Yes. So, we so have which quadrant? So, we're getting to the 90, 180 degree. Yes, you can quadrant. copy the green, the green color. The green, yes, okay. It's much easier as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. That way. And which is the most equiphasic lead? Uh, probably AVL. I'm not, I'm not I'm not sure. AVL is mostly negative. Oh no, yeah. Um, it's number like, two. It's yes. Yes. Again, two. number two. So sorry. Uh, so it's you have it in this quadrant, and it's ninety degrees from lead number two, which is here on sixty degrees, where the axis stays. Yes, so we are like around 120 degrees. No, no, 60 degrees oh. plus 90 is around more. Mm. So 150? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. So, next example, uh, let's check this one because it's. Those are a little bit more strange, so let's check this one. Can somebody try? I could try. Okay, thank you. And it's it's a little bit not the exact example, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna help you if you need help. Um. Okay. Um. It's a uh, positive in lead one. Yes. Um. And in AVF, it's also positive. Yes. So um, which quadrant? Uh. It's the yellow quadrant. Yes. And then we have a problem, right? We yeah. don't we don't have an equiphasic lead. Yeah. So what 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 are we doing now? So here we have the AV, AVL is negative. Mm -hmm. So when it's positive, when it it was biphasic on the first example, yeah, we we were able to define the axis correctly. That is okay. Here. Right. But mm -hmm. now, when it's negative, then the axis is more away from it, more than 90 degrees away from it. So okay. the axis is around here, between 90 and 60 degrees, but we can't define it correctly. We can guess it. That's mm -hmm. why uh, you have, you don't always have the, the, the most, uh, uh, how to, to put it, uh, um, you don't have the perfect situation. Somehow, some, 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 some. Sometimes you have to, to be. Uh, you have to guess. Uh, I know that it's around here, but I can't guess the the, the 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 right axis because I don't have the means to define it. Because almost everyone. Every lead is positive except for this one. So it's around here somewhere, probably close to 90 degrees, but it's not, we can't define it correctly. So I'm, I thank you for defining it, and I'm giving you that the, the situation in which you don't have the perfect condition to define the axis. So it's above uh, 60 degrees because uh, the lead AV1, uh, the lead AVL is absolutely negative. So it's away from it. So it's around here. Okay. And it should be positive and it should be above uh, below here because lead 1, as small as it is, there is no... The, the R wave is dominant, so it should be around here. Because if it was uh, here, it would be equiphasic, right? So, pointer, pointer, please. So it's around here. 
somewhere between 60 and 90 as defined. Okay? Difficult case to define, but okay. Uh, this is an example. That this is to come down. I thought perfect can be uh, every situation has to be uh, ruled out. So, this is something to confirm the rule. Don't bother that sometimes you have to, to guess among, uh, between some intervals. Sometimes it's, it's impossible to define the axis. So let's skip that example and go to this one. And somebody tries. I can try. Oh. Almost equiphasic equi first lead. Please say it again. I think we have a, a positive first lead. Here. Here. This example. The third. Is the first one by phasing? No, I don't think so. Next. This is the T wave. It's not the only by phasic lead. It's this one. So there's something going down and then up. So, please, the, the first colleague. We can do it together. Okay. So this is the first lead. Yes. So what what is it dominantly negative? Ah or yes, positive so it is positive? slightly negative. It is mainly negative. Uh, this is ST segment and T wave. Okay. The the QRS complex is this one. So it's mainly negative. Then we check which lead. The AVF. Yes, which is... Which is negative. As well. So we have which situation, which quadrant? The blue quadrant. Yes. So the most equiphasic one is which? It's probably this one. Because there are slides Yes. Down there's there's a Q wave and then going up to the R wave. So this is the most equiphasic lead. So we have AVO equiphasic and we have it on 90 degrees in this quadrant. So it's around how much? Uh, it is on 120, minus 120. Yes. Do you find something bothering in this EKG? There are several bothering, there are several things that bothers me. First is that the QRS, the QRS complex is a little bit wider. So widening, widening QRS, it's a band yes. branch block? Mm, you, you could be right if there is, if there isn't. Does this, this should have a pacemaker or something? Yes. Whenever you have a pacemaker, you, where the pacemaker is put? Um, it's put in a... You've got to, it depends how many leads you have, uh, but it's put into the... You are completely right, but I wasn't trying to to mislead you. I was uh, I was trying to to explain why this is happening. So, uh, 
the, the, you are completely right. There, there are several types of pacemaker. Uh, in our time, we are using mainly two. Mm -hmm. We are using the VVI one and the DVI one. Mm -hmm. VVI one means there, there is one lead. Uh, are they put in the left chambers or in the right chambers? The right side. Yes. So when you put the, the pacemaker, you are you are bypassing the the normal conduction system, and it's usually put in the apex or the lower septum. So usually you don't use the Purkinje fibers, so uh, the conduction is rather slow. So that's why you have widening of the QRS complex, and that's why when you put it in the right ventricle, then the axis. Uh, goes through the septum, then enters the Purkinje fibers and goes to the left, and then it, then you have that's why you have the extreme left axis deviation, and then then that's why the, the axis is going to that direction because it's going from down to up and to the left, so it's going here. So. Can somebody try? This is even something other thing. It's going on that quadrant because the, the, the signal is going from the left ventricle backwards. Because usually that's not even a, um, a pacemaker, the usual type of pacemaker. This is TRT, cardiac resynchronization therapy device. Which, which has two electrodes, one in the one in the right ventricle. Usually, it depends in the apex or in the low, lower septum, and then you have one in the left ventricle. And that's why the apex, the the the, the axis is going that way. And what we have here can, sorry, can somebody tries to define this axis? It's a little bit easier. This is the conventional type of pacemaker because uh, the the lead is try. It's easier. Is it positive in lead one? It's lead one. So you have uh, one spike here. The, the electrical activity of pacemaker, when it's visible, it's called spike. It seems like a little line going upwards or here because uh, the the settings of the pacemaker are changed. You can, you can see it that much visible. It usually it's smaller like this. Or even invisible. Sorry. Or even more invisible. So you have small wine here which is spike. It's uh, activation or stimulation of the atria. Usually it's the right atrium. Then you have this spike which is stimulation of the ventricle. And then you have the QRS complex. So that's why you have, when when I asked you how many types of pacemakers there are, DDD means dual chamber. So you have one lead in the, you the the the, the chambers you are using are right chambers because they are low pressure chambers. So if you put something in the arteries, you have constant bleeding and the patient will die from anemia. But in right chambers. You can put something that exits the, 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 the blood vessel and you won't have bleeding more than usual. Uh, and it's only in the procedure, no, no more. So, it here in the usually the, the right atrium. 
all, almost all the direction, then you have one lead in the right bank call. This is the style like uh, in the right bank call. And then uh, the axis is going to the So we have the same situation here. We don't have any equiphasic lead, right? So we have to guess. So lead, which lead? Lead 3 is negative, lead 2 is negative. So when we have lead 2 negative, then the axis is here, around here. So we can't define it correctly, so we can get only guess. So it's in this quadrant, in the red one, and the axis between minus, minus 30 and minus 9. That's all we can tell from this so. one. Okay? It's not a perfect situation. But when we are when we are having the device, it's too stimulating from one chamber to another, and then you have the impulse propagation to orthodox direction. So it's not an easier case. So it depends when uh, usually in those cases you have some. Uh, uh, chamber enlargement or chamber hypertrophy, hypertrophy so uh, the, the, there's slight variation, but you you know that you can use both the leads, which leads first the AVL, AVF, sorry, and then try to find the most equiphasic and try to orientate where the axis is. So, do you feel sure and safe to define the first three things about EKG? And I know that uh, six examples are not enough to feel confident enough, but you can try to, whenever you have an EKG, whenever you see an example, you can try and see. Every colleague of mine, are whenever shows an EKG, is going uh, to explain it or ask it what is the axis of the heart, usually. So, there are several, several other things on these EKGs, but we are going to discuss them later as an example. So, what is the... Yes. In the last example, yes. if the second lead was not again, but it was positive instead of negative, the second lead. Second lead is positive. Yes, instead of negative. Would that mean that the axis is at minus 30 degrees? No. Uh, let me let me check it. Uh, sorry. I don't think in this example a second lead can ever be positive. Because you have it's positive here in AVR, so it's going definitely up. So going definitely up means that in this lead, if uh, if you are asking that uh, we don't see any other lead as it is now, and we only see first AVF and second, then it's positive. Then. Let me see AVF. If it's positive, AVF. It, it could be. Uh, if we are not seeing these two leads, then this can be positive when this is negative. But the axis 
is going to be around here, from 0 to minus 30. This is what you are asking, or I yes, didn't get yes. Because you have negative AVF, that definitely means that the axis is up or away from 0 degrees. Uh, the lead 2 can be positive till minus 30 degrees. So it's around here. The lead 2 and the AVF are uh, defining the axis. Have I answered the question? Yes, thank you. But because I have, if we, if we take the other lead, we have positive both of those leads, which are upper than minus 30 degrees. Uh, the AVR is around here, so it should be around, the axis is around here. Because they are both positive and lead AVL as well. Okay? Yes, ma'am. So, what are we looking at next? presence of P waves or not? Uh, the presence, you are almost right because if there is no present P wave then we have some rhythm disturbance and we have to, de to define it beforehand. So we are looking at the P wave. So what happens when, what are the, the, the normal ranges of P waves? What are we looking at? Less than 120 microseconds? Milli, my micro, not micro. Uh, milliseconds, sorry. So we, we check its length and we check its height. So length is defined by time, height, height is defined by voltage. So you are completely right. We are checking whether the P wave is uh, longer than 120 milliseconds. What does it mean if it's longer? We have a longer atrial depolarization. Which, yes, you are right. And what does it mean? Uh, can you tell me where the sinus node is? Atrium. Which atrium? Right next to where the venacarpa uh, uh, yes. enters yes. the right atrium. Yes, you are right. It's near the entrance of superior vena cava, something called crystal terminalis. But the most important thing can, uh, is it's in the right ventricle. So usually you have first activation of the right atrium, then you have activation almost simultaneously, but a little bit late of the left atrium. So when you have in, uh, enlargement of the P wave, when you have P wave lengthening, then it means that you have uh, P mitrale usually, and you have problem with the left atrium. And when you have this case here, uh, what what's happening? We have problem with P wave height, right? So how many squares is one hundred small squares? Of course, how many small squares are one hundred and twenty milliseconds? Three. So if the wave is below three small squares, it's okay. If it's more, then you have a problem with it. How, what is the range for normal P wave height? 2.5 millimeters. Yes, thank you again. Then you have this situation here, and it's more than, I think, three big squares, more and even more. 
So what's the problem here? Which chamber is at fault for this? If I can put it that way. Is the right atrium? Huh? Yes. When it's higher, then you, you usually have problem with right atrium. When it's longer, then you have usually problem with with uh, left atrium. When you have both of them, so this is called P pulmonale. The other one is called P mitrale, and when you have both, it's called P cardiale. I don't have an example of that, but I'm call I'm explaining it. So, what's next after P wave determination? You are defining every component of the PQRSTU. So, what's next? You have intervals, you have segments, you have. Is it the PR, PR interval? interval? And yes. PRS complex. Yes, etc. Et whether I have something about it. Mm, no. Mm, not usually. So, uh, before, PRS, before PR interval, which was completely right, there's a situation in which sometimes you don't have P waves. Which is which is the what what is happening when you we you don't have P waves? Atrial fibrillation. One possible explanation, yes. But here you have several P waves, but at some point you don't have P waves. Then you have a disease of the sinus. Six sinus syndrome. Six sinus syndrome, yes. You have several types of uh, SA blocks. You have first degree, second degree, and third degree, uh, as it is in AV block. First degree can be detected by, by the uh, conventional EKG machine. Uh, first degree, you have uh, gradually lengthening of the second degree first type, you have gradually lengthening of the PP interval. Then there's no one, there's one P wave not followed by Q, there's no P wave followed. Uh, in second degree, maybe type 2, you have constant. A PP interval, then one P interval is not for, uh, then one P wave is not showing as it is here in the second example. Here you have uh, a junctional escape P and P wave after that. And the third degree is when you don't have P activity, when you, when you don't have actual activity, and it's called SA arrest or third degree SA block. I know it's a little bit complicated, but it's not that much. Usually, when you explain the AV block, it's almost the same, but you have to check the P wave, not the the QRS not the PR interval or QRS complex missing or something like that. Do you understand it? A little bit, at least. So, uh, SA book, first degree, you can't detect it with EKG. Usually you don't see any problem. Uh, there you have to check it with electrophysiological study and it's not routinely used for this disturber. Uh, for second degree, uh, for myobits type 1, you have gradual lengthening of the, RR, of the PP interval. 
and for Mobis type 2 you don't have this, you have constant PP interval, then one P wave is not followed by QRS. And you don't have P wave show, showing. And here you don't have atrial activity for quite some time and the, the patient probably fainted if it's long enough, if it's more than three seconds, if it's older, he or she probably fainted already, or at least has some uh, some dizziness of these cells. Then we were discussing the PR interval. What is the normal length of PR interval? 0 0.12 to 0 0.20? Yes, or 120 milliseconds. This is for seconds and 120 to 200 second, milliseconds, sorry. So what are possible, uh, what is the, 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 is there a way to have short, shorter than 120 milliseconds PR interval? Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. In which case? If the rhythm is uh, initiated by AV node, maybe? Uh, the PR interval, uh, when the rhythm, when you, when you have junctional rhythm and the, the P wave is red for grade, usually it's in the QRS or even the ST or T wave, and there you don't usually have P uh, before QRS complex. You have short PR interval in cases of accessory pathway, right? Or W with syndrome. Parkinson White? Yes, but you are not using Wolf Parkinson White syndrome uh, to define when you have accessory pathway. You are using Wolf Parkinson White uh, syndrome is defined when you have the situation, uh, the anatomical situation in which patient have accessory pathway and that accessory pathway is included in the pathological circle of um, arrhythmia. That's why you using. That's when you are using Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Otherwise, you are calling that pre-excitation or accessory pathway. The, uh, the 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 uh, there was when I was studying uh, somebody calls. Uh, we are we were studying about long enough, uh, why, uh, who, Long and Levine syndrome or LGL. Uh, it's the the presence of this disturbance is question is questioned now in the in the scientific uh, society because there is no anatomical substrate for that. Uh, uh, it's mm, hypothesized that there is only uh, faster conduction through the AV node and there is no specific pathway which is bypassing the AV node. So the one situation when you have uh, a shorter PR interval there and it's a pathological one uh, less than 120 milliseconds is in a uh, situation when you have pre-excitation but you uh, uh, other other thing you have with uh, with uh, sorry it's easier to show you I have seen Wolf Parkinson White So, 
there it is. The PR interval is around uh, 80 milliseconds. You have delta wave, you have YQRS complex, you have SG segment deviation, usually deep depression, not usually but always depression when, whenever where you have positive delta wave. And that's the definition of pre excitation. Okay. Sorry, could you run through those criteria again? Other criteria, sorry. Short PR interval, wide QRS complex due to the delta wave, and SD segment abnormality, usually depression. Whenever you have positive delta wave, you have ST depression. Thanks. So, what are the causes for long PR interval? Uh, first degree block? Yes. So, what PR interval is defining? The time it takes to, um, for the electrical signal to travel from the atria to the AV node. You are almost right. It's through the through the AV node because the the electrical signal is traveling rather fast in the atrium. There are speculate speculation about several pathways uh, in the right atrium which are conducting rather fast. They are spreading the signal from the uh, sinus node to the AV node. They are they are conducting through the left atrium so that it can be activated almost as in the same time as the right ventricle so there is no um, delay there so there could be less delay between the both atria and after that in the both ventricles so uh, the most part the, the most important part which the a the, the PR interval represents is the delay uh, in the AV node. You are seeing the contraction, the, the, the deviation of the P wave, which means the contraction of, uh, of the, the atria. But the signal is already in the AV node. It's delaying. It's delayed there. So the PR interval is representing mainly the delay in the AV node. Okay? So, what, yes. what are the possibilities there as we have talked about uh, the SA node disturbances? So, uh, one of you, I, I heard female voice saying that AV node first, uh, AV block first degree, right? So what is the definition of AV, uh, AV block first degree? That's where it's above the normal threshold, but you still have a QRS for every P, right? Yes, and what was the threshold? What is the upper limit for a normal threshold? Uh, 0.2 seconds, I think. Uh, no, uh, you didn't get it? You didn't got it. 0.2 seconds? 0.2 seconds, 0.2. Right. You said point 0.2, so 0 0.2 seconds or 20, 200 milliseconds, or one big square, okay? This is, sorry, this is the first scenario here. So we can take this one because the, the beginning of the QRS complex is uh, the beginning of, is the end of the, this uh, square, so five small squares, six, seven, almost eight, rather 280, probably more, right? So we have a block first degree. What, what happens when you have 
second degree AV block. You have type 1 uh, when you go back to second degree AV block. Mm -hmm. um, is that where the P wave is going and the QRS um, complex is, the PI interval is prolonging and then it drops and there's no QRS complex? Yes. And then you have type 2 where the P uh, wave is regular but the um, is by QRS complex. Yeah, this is an example for type 1, right? Yeah. The, the second strip. This is an example. Here we have two examples. First, we have example of second degree AV block myopic type 2, which you have explained perfectly. You have, without lengthening of the PR intervals, you have drop of QRS complex. What, what, what possible types of uh, AV block second degree you have? You have this situation here. You have several P waves which are not followed by QRS complex, which is in here as well. You can have as much as you as much as you can think of, uh, and but there's some P waves which are conducted, and it's called high degree. AV block. Uh, the situation here and the situation here. So several P waves are not conducted. And uh, the, 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 the fourth variant of second degree AV block is when you have every second P wave not followed by QRS compass, which is called 2 to 1 ratio AV block type 2 to 1 ratio, right, here, and you have this one, this situation here, which is complete hard block, or complete AV block. Something that is not well understood, it's rather easy. Professor, can you explain again why the last strip is a complete hard block? Because the atrium activity is independent of ventricle one. Okay, thank you. You have constant PP interval and then you have uh, junctional escape bit because it's they are short, they are uh, narrow, they are not wider. So it's from the AV node. So after PR interval, what we are checking is? QRS? Yes. What are possible what, what, what is the normal range? Uh, what, what we check for QRS? Duration and amplitude. Yes, as, as always. Duration and amplitude. So, uh, you, the, what is the normal duration? 0 0.08 to 0 0.12 seconds. No, it's uh, a 0 Point zero eight to zero point one. If it's above one uh, or one hundred milliseconds, the, you have some pathology. If it's above one hundred and twenty milliseconds or zero point point twelve, you definitely have some pathology. So. Uh, what are possible explanations for uh, lengthening of the QRS complex? Bundle branch block? Yes, or fascicular uh, a fascicular block. Uh, why I'm 
I'm calling fascicular bone because the left bundle has several fascicles, right? How many fascicles are there in the, the left bundle? Uh, we are usually uh, defining two of them. Three? Yes, but there's one more, usually at the septum. And usually there is, we are, uh, because the anterior and the posterior one are quite long, and when you have problem with that, you have conduction disturbance. So we, we usually uh, take into account the, the, the anterior and the posterior. But there's always sept small septal one. You, uh, there may be several others type, uh, several. There may be one other, but usually when we ha when we mean fascicles, we mean the anterior and posterior. The the, the right bundle doesn't have uh, other branches. Usually at the apex of the right ventricle, it goes to the Purkinje fibers. There's no fascicular fascicle there. So, whenever, uh, how can you define whether you have uh, a uh, excuse me, left uh, anterior fascicular block or right or left posterior fascicular block? The criteria are mainly uh, abnormal axis deviation, as you can see. Can somebody define this axis here? The first here, this one. It's easy. Okay, so one's positive, uh, yes. AVF is negative. Yes. And that so means that it should be between 0 and minus 90, right? Yes. Yes. You are completely right. I should put an axis here as well. So lead a lead two is uh, negative, so it's above. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So lead two is completely negative, so it's above minus thirty. So that's the definition of the uh, of left anterior fascicular block. You have left axis deviation between uh, above minus thirty or sometimes even minus. 45, uh, you have widening, widening of the QRS complex between 0 0.10 and 0 0.12 here, and left axis deviation. That's the definition of left anterior fascicular block. Okay? Can somebody try to define this axis? Somebody has already defined it. I, I, I think I had an example uh, in previously shown. So, somebody, it's easier. Between 90 and 180? Yes. Is it? So the first was negative and the AVS was positive. So the axis is around here. So when you have right axis deviation, pathological type, above 90 degrees, because uh, first was most uh, was definitely negative, so it's around here, and widening of the QRS complex between uh, 0 0.10 and 0 0.12, then you have uh, left posterior fascicular block. Okay. So, when you have complete uh, bundle branch block, you have two types. You have, when you have M-shaped QRS complex in V1, or rabbit ears, or it has several names, or, and you have wide 
R wave in V6, in V6 and the QRS complex is wider than 120 milliseconds. Usually the, the axis is normal or, uh, or right normal type. Then you have right bundle branch block. When you have almost Q-shaped uh, V1 and sword or notch wider QRS complex in V6, in V6 more than 120 milliseconds, it's called left bundle branch block. Okay. One you have M shaped in V1 for uh, for for uh, right bundle branch block. Uh, in left bundle branch block you have M shaped in V6. Okay. Do you need more examples? Do you do you want to see it in as a whole EKG in internet? It's quite simple. You only need V1 and V6. Professor, how many boxes, small boxes, are the normal duration of QRS? Uh, normal is 2.5. That's around, because one small square is 40 milliseconds, or 0 0.04. So, 100 milliseconds or uh, 0 0.1 is 2.5 small squares. So uh, to be uh, 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 to be, so to be pathological, the 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 length of the QRS it should be above three small squares. Thank you. No, 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 no. Usually you have this one. It mean it uh, looks like pathological Q, uh, Q, uh, pathological QRS complex as, as an infarction here. As uh, sorry, it, 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 it's not showing. It ha you have predominantly negative QRS complex in V1, which is. SW because you have some notching here, but the most important part is you have positive QRS complex in V6 in left bundle branch block with notching here, which looks like uh, the uh, the letter M. Could you show us a couple more examples of that? Too much trouble? No, not really. I just have to write left bundle branch block here and they are going to. Okay. So you have a Q wave here and you have. Uh, M shape QRS here in V6. You see it? As it is here, you have almost Q wave here and positive and M shape. There's slight notching here on the down sloping part of the QRS complex. As well, as here, there's another example of normal EKG, a precordial list. This is the left bundle branch block, uh, and this is the right bundle branch block. M-shaped here in V1. Uh, in V1, you have 
absolutely negative Q-shaped Q wave. And you have M-shaped here with notching or swaying of the QRF complex in big peaks for left bundle branch book. And here for right bundle branch book you have S wave uh, which is wider and you shouldn't have in normal QRF complex as it is here. Uh, other examples, other examples. I have shown this. Uh, what else? Other examples. Here, one more. Do you get the feel of it? I think so. Yes, you have wider, absolutely positive sword or notch QRS contact in V6 for left bundle branch book. And you have uh, M shaped uh, here M shaped R, R prime R prime S R in V one. This is probably Pugada in from here as well R prime R S R R type in V1 only V1 run gears run gears run gears here as well and the QRS complex should be above 120 milliseconds so here as well Rather, it's not a typical, but it's right when the branch walk. Another ex example you have no QR type here, but it's right when the branch walk. Do you get the feel of it? Yeah. Thanks. So, what was the other? Uh, what was the other uh, what was the other spec of QRS uh, complex? Amplitude? Yes. Um, what so LPH? Is, what is this what it is for? So if you've got hypertrophic muscle you've obviously got a lot more depolarization going on, so it's gonna look okay. Yes. But can you have uh, higher amplitude and normal, 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 uh, let's say myocardial mass, not hypertrophic? Probably. Yeah. In hypertension? Yeah. I'm talking about the QRS, not for the Q weight. But you can have. Especially, uh, it's usually in women because their chest wall is so thin and the convection can be visualized quite easily. So usually, and in, in children as well, and in skinny people mostly. So, what are the the, the criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy? Hypertension. No, no, criteria on EKG. V5 and V6 over 25 millimeters plus an S wave. Uh, yeah, the first the first part was correct, the second one wasn't. Uh, so uh, the, the, the definition is R wave in V1 or uh, not R wave but S wave in V1 or V2 more than 25 seconds or R wave, R wave in V5 or V6 more than 25 millimeters, sorry, I said second, or R in V6 or V5 plus the R in V1 or V2 more than 35 uh, millimeters. Okay. Is 
it is. Did you get it? If you are looking at uh, one of the R waves, then it's 25. If you uh, if you are looking for the sum of R plus S, then it's more than 35. Uh, there are several other criteria. R in lead AV1, uh, in lead AVL, and R in lead 1. Uh, the R in lead AVL is more than 15 millimeters, and R in lead AVL more than 11 millimeters. Do you get that? Usually when you have severe hypertrophy, you have ST depression and T wave due to the abnormal repolarization of the ventricle. And it is in here. It's usually not due to the ischemia, it's usually usually to the slow repolarization process. So R or S wave more than 25 milliseconds in lead V1, V2 for S wave, V5, V6 for R wave, or the sum of those one of those leads V1 plus V6 or V2 plus uh, V5 more than 35 milliseconds. A, uh, AVL more than 11 seconds, then 11 millimeters. Sorry, if I had said second, I meant millimeters or a, uh, first lead more than 15 millimeters. That's for left ventricular hypertrophy. For right ventricular hypertrophy, you're usually usu uh, uh, checking the lead V1. In lead V1, in lead V1, when you have toe R wave or uh, change a ratio between R wave and S wave, the R wave should be uh, the ratio should be more than one R to S, and the other or the R wave should be more than six millimeters, or the R wave in lead AVR more than three millimeters. Then you have a left, uh, right ventricular hypertrophy. You are a little bit quiet, which is concerning me. It's just numbers. You have to remember them. That's all. More uh, change ratio. Usually here you have small R and deep S. When that ratio is change, when you have bigger R, usually above uh, bigger than the S, and it's above six millimeters, and the R here in I AVR is above three millimeters, then you should check for right ventricular hypertrophy. Usually there are other signs like uh, right axis deviation and so on, but that's the definition of uh, right ventricular hypertrophy. So, after uh, after the QRS complex, we are we are checking the ST segment. Usually, it's isoelectrical. Sometimes it's above when when we have elevation. It's pathological. Most of the time, it depends, uh, but some other.
uh, my colleagues will, is going to be talking about it, when you have elevation, or is it ST elevation myocardial infarction, or is it pericarditis, when you have depression, is it due to another type of ischemia, or ST uh, myocardial infarction without ST elevation or non staining uh, Then we have the two waves abnormalities. Uh, one of you said that when we have uh, uh, change T wave, it can be a sign of, hy of uh, high potassium. When you have narrow uh, high T wave. One of possibility is high potassium. The other one is the first and most acute phase of myocardial infarction. This is the first, the most early signs of myocardial ischemia. So high narrow T wave uh, with in, uh, concordant leads which means when you said concordant leads, those are the leads representing one of the walls. So if you have it in one lead or in different leads, not, rep not representing one wall or several walls close to each other, because if it's uh, a myocardial infarction uh, with, uh, in, as a, as a when when the the core of the of the of, of left main, then you have bigger zone, or and you have let uh, let's say the the interior and lateral walls, so have several walls, but they are concordant. Uh, so you have to check whether the the leads the changes are in concordant leads. Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit tired. Probably you, you got tired as well. So uh, you are checking the T waves. When you have uh, low T waves, it may represent high potassium or the first early stage of myocardial ischemia. When you have negative T waves, you have to wait or to watch out um, for ischemia or there's when you are there, uh, T waves, negative T waves, it's not so sensitive sign of ischemia, so we have to check out as well to check it. Uh, what else? You have to check the QT interval. Whenever the QT interval is narrow, you have to check for drugs which can narrow it. One of them is digoxin. Uh, you have a genetic uh, problem called short Q QT interval. A short QT interval is below 360, 340, depends on gender. Uh, when it's longer, there is also genetic predisposition, not predisposition, a genetic problem and genetic disease, what, which is called uh, long QT interval and it can get longer in ischemia, it can get longer when you are using several drugs and several classes of antiarrhythmics. And when you have new waves, uh, it could be in younger, in younger person. And whenever you have some electrolyte disturbances, so that's for EKG, sorry, I have to, to tell you about a patient in a clinical case and do you need some rest or we can finish it now? We can finish it now. Uh, okay, so can I grab a cup of... Yeah, if you need a rest, that's absolutely fine. Just a cup of water. I'm gonna uh, just to stop the microphone.
is the tab at the top. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, 20 seconds, please, just 20 seconds. So the case, you have 68 years old man with complaints of shortness of blade, uh, shortness of breath and uh, fatigue uh, when he is exercising his usual daily activity from 12, 12 hours ago. He has never had such complaints. He denies uh, any chest discomfort like pain or other things. He denied ankle swelling. He had arterial hypertension for for at least five years with uh, maximal values of 180 to for di for systolic uh, blood pressure and for diastolic 100 and usual uh, values of 140 to 85. He's he has high blood cholesterol, and uh, the patient denies uh, some uh, family history of ischemic heart disease. He doesn't have allergies. He is a smoker for more than 20 years, and he is using the combination treatment for arterial hypertension of sartan and calcium channel blocker. And the doses you are seeing, he is using both sartan. 116 and amodipine 5 milligrams. So he is a little bit obese with a body mass index of 30. He lies, he, he is not orthopnoic, he doesn't have jugular venous distension, he has normal breathing without crackles, his uh, blood oxygenation is around 90, 98%. His heart rate is around 170. Uh, his blood pressure is around 110 to 80. And he doesn't have ankle swelling and uh, his pulsation of the legs are not so, uh, they are not well palpable. So what are your thoughts about the, the situation of the patient? the patient condition. Crazy high risk for every cardiovascular disease under the sun? Yes, usually yes, but the main disturbance here, the main condition is obviously the, the high heart rate, the higher heart rate around 170. So you, we should check for uh, Rhythm disturbance or conduction disturbance from something. So what you have this patient, you you are the cardiologist on duty. You are asking the emergency department and what are the things you gonna order? First of all, an ECG, right? Yes, this is an ECG. What else? Troponin, uh, creatine kinase. Let Come, let's uh, extend it to to full blood sample because we need several things there. We're gonna discuss it. Which what order? Else? D Which order? D dimer. Uh, usually not because uh, when you have, if we are expecting some rhythm disturbance, we'll discuss it later. Uh, at some point, it probably will get higher. What else do we need? Uh, to check the electrolytes? Uh, it, levels. It's part of the WAP. So, EKG WAP, what else? An echo? Yes, at some point. 
Thank you. And what else? X-ray? Yes. Uh, we're going to discuss every, uh, every speck of it, but let's start with EKG. Can somebody try to interpret it? First, what is the rhythm? Looks like it's a sinus rhythm. Looks like, but is it? Is this a P wave or a T wave? It's a T wave. Yes, so it's not a P wave. Are the RI intervals constant, EQ, or something? Especially Wait, no, they aren't, sorry, no. Yes, so uh, you, have, you have tachycardia, right? So you have, you don't see P wave, especially here when, when there are intervals a little bit uh, longer, you don't, you don't have P wave here. So you have a rhythm disturbance with different RR intervals with no visible P wave. So Is it atrial fibrillation? So we have atrial fibrillation, right. So you have a rhythm disturbance. What's next? What, what, what next? Should we define? The heart rate? Yes. We have discussed it earlier. You, you should take uh, at least five RR intervals. If you want to be more precise, you can take ten. But what we see here is that the RR interval is more than two big squares, is less than two big, big squares. So if it was two big squares, what's the heart rate? 150. So, thank you. So the heart rate is above 150. Do we need, do we need to know more? I oh, think so. Uh, it's enough. It's tachyarrhythmic, it's arrhythmia, definitely atrial fibrillation. So, yes, it's around uh, 1.2 big squares, or let's check uh, 150 divided by 7, let's say. Uh, 1,500 divided by 7. Can somebody... Uh, a little over 200? Something uh, 11, 5, uh, no, 1500, 1500, divided by 7. 2200-ish? Something like that. So the, the heart rate is around 200, right? So we have atrial fibrillation, we have heart rate of 200 around, and what's the axis? Between zero and ninety. Can somebody speak separately? It seems normal in the right quadrant. Yes, it's normal. Sorry, 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 sorry. So, first was positive. Second, uh, the ABF was positive, and we had by phasic AVL. So it was around here, and it, by phasic it was equiphasic was uh, uh, AVL. So axis is on how many degrees? 0 to 90. Zero to 90, but 60. Exactly. Yeah. 60. So we have defined that patient has atrial fibrillation. His heart rate is around 200. His axis is normal or indifferent, around 60 degrees. So what else? There's no visible STT abnormalities. The ST segment is on the hydroelectric line. Uh, there's no ST elevation or depression. So the T wave looks normal almost everywhere. 
so we don't expect any uh, changes, any ischemic changes, because the heart rate is rather rather high. So the 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 the, the heart is exercising quite a lot, so the the demand should be higher, and if there is uh, an occlusion or uh, even a stenosis, you can have ischemia in this high rate because the the patient is as he is he's exercising or doing the stress test, right? Because the heart rate is rather high. So, sorry. For WAP results, we have normal WAP results, but what? What do we need for from the lab? Do we need blood count? No. Why not? We need it because we do because maybe he has anemia. Yes, that's one of things. And usually, when when you have uh, arrhythmia, you should you should check for uh, secondary problems like infection or ev everything else. A blood count can be helpful because the anemia can be a problem for uh, uh, what do we need in atrial fibrillation? We need anticoagulation. So when you have anemia, it can be problematic. Uh, so. Uh, you, you check for an, uh, for hemoglobin, you check for platelets, and you check for white blood cells, but you should take into account that uh, white blood cells arise in every stressful situation. So when they are slightly elevated, that, that doesn't mean something. And if you are, if you are uh, considering infection, you should try and uh, and test other factors as CRP or procalcitonin. Okay? What else do we need? We need uh, creatinine levels, not uh, CP, uh, CPK, but we need creatinine levels because uh, if patient has some degree of uh, kidney disease, of chronic kidney disease, or uh, chronic kidney insufficiency, or patient is on dialysis, you are restricted uh, in anticoagulant, uh, anticoagulant use. Some anticoagulants are contraindicated in patients with uh, GFR less than 30. Some are in less than 15, but we are going to discuss them later. Do you, need, do you understand that? Uh, you have uh, some bar, some one of you uh, told uh, said that uh, we have to check electrolyte as well because electrolyte disturbances can be a, a reason for uh, for rhythm and conduction disturbances. Atrial fibrillation is one of them. So definitely electrolyte and troponin levels. If you are seeing ST segment deviation, and one more thing, if the patient is has come uh, during the night, it's not part of the routine measurement. But at the next day, you should uh, check his thyroid function because uh, as hypo as Hyperthyroidism, they are both reasons for every type of uh, rhythm disturbances. So we need lab for excluding uh, ischemia, if excluding uh, chronic kidney disease, electrolyte disturbances, and to check the blood count uh, just in case it's because uh, it's going to be risky when you're applying some of the drugs. So, uh, 
a female voice said echo. Why do I need echo? To see the function. Uh, to see the function said the male, the female, I, I didn't hear her. I didn't hear her. The structures, the heart, and the vocal, you mean? So, the structure of the heart, what do I need from the structure of the heart? When I say atrial fibrillation, what, uh, what is the chamber? Dilation, from. dilation of the atrium. The uh, the atrium what? Which atrium? Yes, it's atrium. Which atrium? Say, hey, you have fifty fifty chance, fifty fifty chance. Of getting right. Left. You guessed right. So, uh, the origin of, of atrial fibrillation is left atrium. So, I have to check left atrium because pathology of mitral valve, as it is in here, uh, this is a standard echo view. It's called parasternal long axis view. Here, his left atrium, he's here, is the left ventricle, this is the aortic valve, this is the right ventricle. What we see here, uh, you can't tell, but I can tell you, uh, that this is in large left atrium, you have something here in the aortic valve, and you have in large right ventricle. They are both in large because the mitral valve is thickened, and this is due to the mitral valve stenosis. Okay, so we, we use echo because we can see changes in the mitral valve which can be responsible for left atrial enlargement and when you have enlargement you have hypertrophy and you have fibrosis which are things that can facilitate developing and sustaining atrial fibrillation, okay? What else? In this case here, I have Neural. power Doppler of, of rather severe mitral regurgitation. So those both pathologies can cause enlarging, enlargement of the left atrium, which can lead to atrial fibrillation. Okay, what else do I need? Uh, the, the first male student said structure and function. I need structure, that's one of the structures, but I need left ventricle. I, sorry, I have to check whether the left ventricular function is almost, uh, is okay, because some of the uh, drugs we are using to uh, to, 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 to convert the rhythm are contraindicated when you have poor left ventricular systolic function. Some of the drugs are contraindicated when you have left ventricular hypertrophy above 14 millimeters. The, the reference range is 12 millimeters for men and 11 for women. So uh, I need echo not only to see the reason, but to guide the therapy as well, okay? And what do I need x-ray for? I guess you can see enlargement, pulmonary edema, that sort of thing. Yes, you are completely right. That's all that I need x-ray for. If there is uh, sorry, I pressed that. If there is congestion, and the other thing is if I don't have the echo at the
the emergency room, I can see the left atrial enlargement. Okay? So, what do we do next? Uh, we have to restore the rhythm and prevent stroke, right? Yes. This is the theoretical base of atrial fibrillation, the mechanism, the classification, and the risk factors for atrial fibrillation. What we need, because uh, I think Associated Professor Ivanova is going to discuss with you the different types of arrhythmia and atrial fibrillation as well. Uh, this is the epidemiology, and we have to, to skip and go to the therapy. And the coagulation, maybe? Here, yes. You have two things to discuss. First is the rhythm, whether you convert it or just slow the heart rate, and the other thing is anticoagulation. So, if this is the first case as it is in this patient, uh, the, the, one of the most important things is the duration of the arrhythmia. As you can see here, if the duration uh, is less than 48 hours, you can safely go to conversion. If it's more than 48 hours, then you have two choices. You can perform TE at the bedside of the patient and exclude left atrial appendage thrombus and convert the rhythm. And the other option is at least three to four weeks of stable anticoagulation if you are using uh, of vitamin K antagonist, or if you are using non-vitamin K antagonist, then you can just give them to the patient, and after three to four weeks, then you admit the patient and try to convert the rhythm. And if the patient is has come more than 24, uh, more than 48 hours. Uh, you can choose to slow the heart rate, just slow the heart rate with di without digoxin, or you can use digoxin, but you should stop it several days after, before the procedure, before the conversion, because digoxin uh, suppress the sinus nodes, and if you convert the rhythm on digoxin, you can have some problems or issues, or you can call whatever you like it, but it's problematic. So. First, you have to decide which such strategy to take, rhythm control or rate control. If the patient is uh, in his uh, let's say 20th uh, attempt to, to, to convert the rhythm, his uh, left atrial is his left atrium is larger. It's probably not a wise decision to convert the rhythm because we are not sure whether he's going to sustain it. And probably the rhythm control is not an option anymore. And you have to go with rate control. Because uh, converting the rhythm, uh, uh, when the patient goes from atrial fibrillation to, to sinus rhythm, it's uh, they have several complaints. It's they are feeling, uh, they are they are feeling the heart rate. They are feeling the uh, as a strong heartbeat, and the other way around as as well. And it's getting more problematic than com than uh, staying the way they are. So first, uh, you know, when the patient has come earlier, in, before the in his in this for in these 48 hours, you can try to you have to decide whether to convert it or to uh, to control the rate. So that's the first thing, and the second thing is to choose what anticoagulation to give the patient. Do 
understand that. I haven't. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yes, I haven't talked about uh, one other option. You have a patient which is hemodynamically unstable. When you have a patient which is who is hemodynamically unstable, you have cardioversion for it, for him. With, no matter what type of arrhythmia you have, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, the fit is Okay. Professor, is, it, uh, is there some preference uh, of electrical or chemical cardioversion? Uh, if the patient is uh, uh, in these 48 hours, uh, he usually has uh, some treatment. Uh, I usually prefer uh, in the on the right there's the, the, the medication which are used for uh, converting the rhythm. In Bulgaria we have venous amiodarum and propofenone and uh, as pills we have amiodarum, propofenone and flecainit. Uh, usually uh, when uh, the patient has come early on, I try to convert with propofenone if there is no contraindication for it. The contraindication for it are uh, severe or at least moderate left ventricular hypertrophy, systolic dis dysfunction, or symptom of, symptoms of uh, heart failure. It's contraindicated there. Or ischemic heart disease. It's contraindicated due to its proarrhythmic uh, properties. Uh, I prefer propafenone because starts acting as early as application. And if you, you, you can convert it in several minutes. Usually if, uh, if there is no success, I switch to amiodarone. Uh, for amiodarone, there is no cardio depression effect. So you can use it in every patient with structural heart disease, but you need you need uh, quite a dose of it. So you have to wait. Usually. If the patient hasn't convert, uh, if the rhythm hasn't been converted, at some point we are discussing electrical cardioversion. But at the beginning, when we see a patient who is hemodynamically stable, first I'm considering medicate, medic, uh, uh, using drugs or using medication to convert the rhythm. Okay. And so electrical cardioversion is uh set to be used to uh when 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 you don't succeed with medication or when the patient has come after those three to four weeks after uh so after anticoagulation after uh, successful anticoagulation and then you uh put him to sleep and convert it I can tell you that there's there's no safer uh, method than electrical cardioversion. It's safer in, and uh, its success is higher than any other, but it's stressful to the patient. So you you use it as a second choice. You need an anesthesiologist for it if the patient is not hemodynamically unstable, of course. If he is stable, you need an anesthesiologist. 
do you need uh, to have any questions? Um, professor, how would you define a patient that is hemodynamically unstable? So you tell me you don't you don't know the criteria for shock? Oh, it's the same as shock. Okay, all right. Uh, hemodynamically unstable means that patient is in shock. Sorry, I, okay. I don't mean to be rude or something. Hemodynamically unstable. Sorry, it means that patient is in shock. So one one of the you have to. Uh, I'm stop. I stop talking about the shock and the stability. Uh, first, we have defined that the patient uh, the strategy about the rhythm or rate control, and the second thing we have to choose for anticoagulation, right? So how we choose whether the patient needs, needs constant anticoagulation, and how we choose which anticoagulant. So we have scores which facilitate defining the needs of the patient. The most successful score, sorry for that, 